This is the Global Broadcasting Service, serving remote outposts since 1928. Hi, everyone. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Caramba, we have something really big for you today. Welcome, foolish mortals. Now then, hang on to them hats and glasses, because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness. This is the DBC Pod with Phil Schoen and Jason Dodge. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's pod. This is the week in review of December 18th, 2021. Back to our original recording day of Sunday. I think we recorded last Sunday too. Yeah. So uh, we're set, Phil, for that. The new look, we want to appreciate some of the feedback that we got from folks out there saying that they like it. My uh, brother-in-law came over... Um, a couple days ago, he's like, I heard your shout-out from last week's show. So now he's getting another <laughs> shout-out. Hey, Bill, Did he approve going? of the new format? Did he like it? He, did, he didn't say. I think he just liked hearing his name on the TV. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Yeah, he, he he liked it. He gave a thumbs up on it. Um, so this is this is more of our new format. And uh, we've got, like, we're kind of doing this kind of cold open kind of question. And I'm thinking about editing the show differently. I don't I don't know. How, how I'm going to do it. Um, but anyway, the cold open question this week, Phil, is, you know, we're, we've been talking about planning this week's um, topic of choice is planning out your park days, your cadence, how, how your kind of vacation fits together. And uh, but the qu- real question is, Phil, when do you start planning your planning? Like, when does the seed of your next trip start kind of growing? And not not like you've been going a lot in the last year, right? Yeah. So let's let's get back to like maybe like an annual or every eighteen months type of trip that you probably have done in the past before. When do you start planning your planning? So when you say like even having a seed or a, just the mm-hmm. start of something, I feel like that I'm never not planning. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> so it's like always like well maybe we'll do this this year and then the next year we'll do that the year after you know like that type of a thing. Um, I'd say that doesn't count like, though as planning though. Yeah. Planning is like. I have a mind of what my spreadsheet is going to look like type of planning. So I think I'd say nine to 10 months out, um, you know, because I probably start getting a a vague spreadsheet going. And then, you know, before it was the 180 day mark for dining was kind of like, okay, we got to get serious. got six months. Yep. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's the uh, serious part, but there's (laughs) more planning happens before that. Yeah, so I think, you know, even like our summer vacations for next year, we have our hotels booked and stuff like that. So it's probably, I mean, once you start thinking about like booking a hotel, it's probably close to a year out as far as like, okay, that's the week we're going type thing. Yeah. Um, probably get the spreadsheet going about nine months out, something like that. So I'm trying to remember how I did it the last time because I've been planning trips. Mm-hmm. Like this is I'm, I've planned three trips since March of 2020, right. and I haven't gone on any of them yet, <laughs> right? So I'm trying to remember what what cadence was for getting planning. But essentially, um, you get the sense of depression when you come home from your trip, right? Right. Then it's usually about a month or two before you start planning when your next trip is going to be, just in a vague window, and you book exactly. something, yeah, yeah. right? And for those out there that are listening that haven't booked trips recently or kind of do it differently, book early and book often. Right. So in old Disney, usually your best room rate is going to be the rack rate 18 months out or 16 months out or whatever. Usually the discounts that you see that are 20, 25 percent off, they match the rate it was when they was first available for booking. It costs you 200 bucks to put down some dates if you book a package through the website, fully refundable at any time. So as long as you're not hurting for that two hundred dollars. Start just booking all the days until you finally find something that you really like, and then you just refund all the other ones. That's the best way to do things. Then again, not everybody can afford to have two hundred dollars on hold by the Disney company. So, um, <laughs> but it's something that you could do, and that's money not lost. It's like putting it in the bank, just not earning interest. Not that anybody earns interest anymore on. Yeah, I'm using that uh, eighth of a percent of interest. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can buy a piece of bubble gum in five years. Um, so yeah, so book often, and then I, I think. I think before when when like your point was six months out, that's when you should. I already have a spreadsheet. I know where all my parks are and whatever. And I usually about, I, I think I'm actually about nine months out. We start having the family events where we're like we start, we get a whiteboard out and we start matching what parks, what days. Um, so, but we're gonna talk about the rules of planning and stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, before we get into our first topic that uh, you announced on social media, uh, we're not going to do any DCI updates today because Matt's been in the parks, and he, mm-hmm. apparently he's doing a big update tomorrow. 
And yeah. so we'll talk about it next week on the show. Uh, that would be the day after Christmas. We're recording next week, right, Phil? That's what I, I asked you if we were going to do that because we yeah. have the day after Christmas and then the day after New Year's. But they kind of line up that that should be okay it's to record. Not, so. not a problem for me. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So, um, so you don't get yep. nobody gets a break from us. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I, I think our New Year's show we're going to go. I have I've been staring at the things that we talked about la- a year ago, and it's going to be fun. <laughs> I haven't looked at them. I just I just see a file, and I'm like, I can't remember what exactly we said was in store for 2021. So we're going to judge ourselves. I'm sure we got it all right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so the co- topic today, Phil, was a good one, um, is how do you arrange your park days? And uh, we're going to try to keep this conversation to like a reasonable length of time <laughs> and not like five hours because I'm pretty sure we could do that. Um, and of course, when you start arranging your park days, that just leads you to a whole range of other things. So right. we're probably going to plan a whole vacation here and stuff <laughs> like that because it all, it's all attached. But um, so... Let, let's start with this. Um, Phil, when you think about arranging your park days, what are the classifications on length of stay that you kind of group things together? Because some people, there's like short stays, there's long stays, and there's even longer stays. So where, where are your, I guess, groupings days-wise? Or do you just kind of put it all together? I guess for, for us, our typical vacations are a week long. Um, and so that's what we're thinking of, like, you know, arrive on a Saturday, leave on a Saturday. We usually plan a couple down days, so we get uh, we, we've really never had more than like five days of park tickets. Sure. When we go, um, so we've done a few. Like th- this year was obviously a little bit different. We kind of did a shorter Disney stay around the fiftieth and stuff like that. But a, a typical annual trip for us is that week long stay, whether it's on site or off, with about five days of park visiting during that week. And you've been consistent on that, you'd have to say, for the most part? Yeah. I mean, for, well, the big thing is, especially if we stay off property, we usually use the timeshare that we have access to, which we usually just, usually a week is the easiest to find, mm-hmm. like, a block for. So that tends to be kind of how we go. So so I, I kinda, I've i done two different vacations. We've done the longer ones where we have seven, eight days of potential park days, not counting arrival and departure days. Yeah. And I've done trips that are under a week. Um, so I basically classify it as trips that I can do all the parks mm-hmm. and trips that I have to selectively maybe eliminate a park to go to. Okay. Like for my September trip, we had, a, we go, we're doing a magic kingdom obviously. And then we had to pick one other park. So that was kind of a different way to, to do things. Um, our 2017 trip, um, we did not do animal kingdom cause we only had three park days. So we had it selectively picked. And then our last trip that we went to in 2019, um, we just did everything. Now you're deciding which ones to duplicate and when, right? Um, okay, so now let's – we're going to – I think to make it easy, we're going to talk about trips that you can easily access all four parks. Yeah. And I mean, and that's typically a, what we do. I think that's always why we go for like at least that week we figure we need at least a day for each park and then one or two more. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, this last week we only did, or last year we only did three days. So we had to do the same question you had. Okay, well, which park are we not going to? Uh, but our average, you know, generally we plan around like, well, we're going to go to all four parks at least one day to each park. So, yeah. so okay, so when you're in your la- my last trip, we had to eliminate a park, uh, or actually we had to eliminate two parks. We did Hollywood Studios because we didn't, haven't done Gal- uh, Galaxy's Edge yet, so that was kind of an easy type yep. of thing. So. Let's just add an extra day in there. Let's say you have three park days. Um, is that an easy choice on eliminating one park, or do you eliminate two parks and double up on another park? How, how do you usually kind of handle that if you're not going for like a full? Uh, for us, day? we would definitely eliminate just one. We would probably still want to do three of the four parks because I think we would. There's enough at each park that we would want to do some of those things more than two days at one one of the other parks. So we would we would do three parks, three different parks. So. Um, which one would you eliminate then? How do you choose which one not to do? That's the question. Yeah. So for us, I mean, we generally, I can't imagine a trip that we don't do Magic Kingdom and Epcot. Mm-hmm. So for our third, it's it's deciding between Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom. Of late, we kind of made the same decision you did just because there's more new at mm-hmm. Hollywood Studios. Like our last trip, we hadn't done Mickey and Minnie's. We'd only done Galaxy's Edge once. Um, so that's why that won out. If there wasn't that newness factor to it. I think we probably do animal kingdom. I think we just like that park a little bit better, but it's pretty close between those two for us. Yeah. I mean, I I don't, you always have to do magic kingdom. And I think 
my Hollywood Studios is your Epcot without all the mm-hmm. nostalgia and memories attached to it, yeah. just because it's more fun for the family. We get more out of the day yep. there. Um, that might change once Epcot's on a construction zone uh, again. And my kids don't have any attachment to Epcot and, with memories and other right, stuff. Hopefully, sure. we could build that up, right? But mm-hmm. as of right now, that doesn't really uh, matter to them. So, okay, so now we're going on to what our typical vacations are. And I would have to say that most typical families are at least having enough time to go all four parks, yeah. or at least a good majority of them. I, I'm not going to peg it at 90%, but maybe north of 65%. I'd say tip, so, yeah. Your typical vacation is going to have that many days. Um, so I never go to the parks my arrival day or departure day. For the most part, um, I had it planned one day because adding an eighth ticket um, was like a dollar for everybody, <laughs> and we were departing late. So I'm like, I toyed with the idea. I added it, um, and then of course that was our, one of our canceled trips. Uh, right. Do you typically aim for those days? Like you land, you go and right to a park because I know you typically have um, your own traditions for your arrival day yeah so typically we do not go to a park on our arrival or departure day unless it's something like you said where it's like adding that extra day was like almost free or or even like our last trip we did do our arrival day to universal studios because they had a deal where you buy two days get two days free so you had it right yeah yeah but if 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 excluding those situations we would not go on our arrival day or departure day um, like you, I think I've mentioned here several times that kind of our tradition is we try to see some fireworks our arrival day from outside of the park. So we got mm-hmm. we want to get there, get settled. If it's early enough, maybe do some pool time or something like that. Then find a nice place for dinner where we can either see the fireworks from dinner or then go from dinner to a location we can see fireworks. That's kind of our arrival day. So, you know, 90 percent of the time we're not going to a park on our arrival or departure day. Yeah, I'm tr- I'm getting ready for vacation, and I know the Disney vacation is not a relaxing one yeah. uh, for the most part, right? You can make it relaxing, obviously, but um, we're going from from my perspective. I'm spending a lot of money. I want to get a lot done, and mm-hmm. you know, my wife and I are not near retirement or retired where we don't have grandkids or no kids trip where we can just kind of take our time and we don't have to hustle with 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 the with the kiddos. So yeah, so. My arrival day, my traditions are evolving. I like your idea. I might steal it one of these days. <laughs> um, but I like to ease in to the bubble, the magic, right? So mm-hmm. explore the resort if it's a, one that I've never been to, do some swimming. Because like, this is going to be the only time where you're not going to feel like time is money, right? At least exactly. for me. Mm-hmm. So I get to actually relax a little bit on this one. I don't have dinner reservations typically. Um, we're not going anywhere. So that I kind of like ease into it and just kind of be like, okay, it's like the uh, the calm before the storm, so to yeah. speak. Um, a good one and a good storm, but still a storm nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. um, so do you have – so now now we're talking about you, – you, it's we're nine months out. We're selecting our park days, right? We're mm-hmm. ready to nail these into place. Do you have any um, – so I guess to make things simple um, – We'll say five full days uh, that you're there with no like no departure, no arrival days, right? So five full days deciding what to do. Do you have any rules of how you plan out your days? Um, what parks? Do you, does it, is it different every time or do you have like a, a set rule for something? So I would say overall it's different every time. I know uh, we posted this question in our, our Discord server and, and I saw quite a few people were like, I want to do Magic Kingdom my first park day, whether it's arrival day or not. And – it's also our, like often if it's, it's our last day too or something like that. We don't do that. If it if it works out that Magic Kingdom's our first day, then great. In the mm-hmm. past, we usually would check crowd calendars and kind of say, okay, well, what's a lower crowd each day? We try to plan around that. I know crowd calendars are probably a little less accurate now than they've been in the past or just not as – we just don't know. We don't have as much data now. Um, the only other rule I could – think of is we usually don't do the same park back to back days if, if we are having a you know if, like you said with five days we probably have mm-hmm. one park we would do twice but other than that we really kind of plan around well which are the low crowd days and where where do we want to eat you know and where do we want to eat on what day and that kind of coincides with what that dictates where you go yeah so you know in discord cast stone the man behind attractionality um he kind of agreed with you he kind of he the crowd calendars basically rule his vacation Right, so he's uh, Adam's a, a good numbers guy. He's good, great with statistics. So he he's the one on Discord. If you want to fi- find um, some lightning lane posts about how dense the selections are and how how they peter out type of thing, um, yeah, he's a good guy to follow on there. But yeah, he, he I never never consider um, th- those uh, those numbers when I when I plan out my days. 
So uh, the crowd calendars to me are almost they're they're right for the most part on aggregate, but they can be highly inaccurate on a day to day mm-hmm. type of thing. Sure. So I have a rule in my vacation. We do Magic Kingdom the first day and Magic Kingdom the last day. Um, I'm kind of like Matt Meadow where he, like, he loved Happily Ever After. There's nothing better than starting your Disney sprint for the week with ending your first day with Happily Ever After. There's nothing that puts you in the mood. I mean, I know Epcot is probably might be that for you, <laughs> right? Um, well, maybe not anymore. Maybe maybe Harmonious will, will put its mark on you for future trips. But right, right, right. For, for me, it was always Happily Ever After and that, that castle the first day. And that's the bit of magic I wanted to leave with, right? I want my last memory to be... Dragging my kids out of that park, asleep <laughs> on my shoulder or otherwise, having just seen that fireworks show. So um, those are my rules. And then I just fill in, you know, depending on what we want to do uh, in the middle. And if we're trying to do all four parks, I usually I always double up on Magic Kingdom. And then, you know, whatever's new, whatever experience we're trying to get, I'll double up on one of those parks. For example, we were doubling up where we were going to double up on Galaxy's Edge and Hollywood Studios, which I typically wouldn't, only because I wanted more Star Wars uh, uh, ex- uh, exposure or or better chances for boarding groups, that type of thing. Right, right, right. Sure. But now that we've done it, um, we probably won't care. Well, we're still doing more because we're going down for like 10 days, so we're gonna, we have to double up on a bunch of parks. Um, okay, so you have no rules. You're, you're basically letting crowd and dining reservations kind of mm-hmm. guide your way. Um, so does your decision tree look completely crazy up until your ADR day where you're kind of deciding where everything is? So how, how are you flexing park reservations versus uh, letting ADRs do the do the talking for you now? So I guess for now, I feel like if you're planning nine months out, you can typically get whatever park reservations you want. So I'm yep. not worried about that too much. It does probably weigh a little in the back of my mind that it might be a little harder to switch things up as we get closer if we need to. So maybe try to get things a little bit more concrete, but um, yeah, I usually have a couple things I'll switch through, um, especially if all of a sudden there's one dining thing that we really want to do that trip and I'm not able to get it for a certain day or something like that, where we might have to switch things around. So that is probably how dining impacts us the most, especially like I said, if there's one, one we really want. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I've kind of worked through different scenarios of saying, okay, well, this is the day we're going to do this. And, and, you know, that's where the spreadsheets really help, I think, where especially if we know we're having a day, we definitely want to rope drop this park or something. We might pick a day that we has an earlier park close the night before or something like that. So I guess the other element that I didn't mention was it's how park hours play a role. Um, Are you reading the same comments I'm reading from? Uh, I guess Ola from Discord, H O L A. Uh, maybe I don't know if she's pronouncing it differently or he's pronouncing <laughs> differently. Um, but they're going uh, basically. Crowd those, calendar. Is, yeah. Well, I'm just reading it right now to kind of catch. She's like, park hours are a deciding factor, and then um, you know the whether or not they're staying there the whole day, type yeah. of thing. So the second question is, um, how many park days in a row? Are you are you going strong with? Because uh, you mentioned, you know, well, let, let's 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 step back. Are the majority of your park days full park days, uh, rope drop to close, or are you kind of you pepper in some like half days here and there? So we don't usually do half days. Um, if I'm paying for a day, I want to get my money's worth from Dang that. Right. That's uh, it. Obviously, you know, like when, when you have a 10 day trip or something like that and you're adding on an extra day for ten dollars or whatever, it's easier to maybe do only do a half day. Or obviously, if it's a trip where you have annual pass passes, then mm-hmm. it's not a big deal to only do a half day. But, you know, for our typical trip, we're getting a four day pass, a five day pass. I want to get my my money out of those passes. So we're doing full days. Um, well, let, let me let me let me let me let me challenge you on that. So now I, that may totally make oh, sense. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The Internet froze everybody up there. My bad. Um, when I talk about half days, uh, you have to I, to be you have to strategi- strategically plan them appropriately. Mm-hmm. And it's going to vary depending on how, what who you're going with. Yeah. As my kids are getting older, I just learned that we just did two full days in a row with like very minimal sleep. And we went we pounded pavement for two full days. And it amazed me. There were no, no kids were like super drop dead tired. It was, it was great. But I was kind of tired after two days. <laughs> so I generally have a second rule, right? So I have, a, I have like a, uh, a logic list. Magic Kingdom first and last day. Never do more than two full park days in a row um, without some kind of break. 
Mm-hmm. Now, the lesson learned from my last trip in 2019 was um, if you're planning the third park day as a half day, never do it in the afternoon because you, you're br- we talked about we talked about this on some yeah, show yeah. last year in 2020, uh, but. You, your brain needs some relaxation, right? Um, what we did was we did two full days in a row, took the morning off, we did some pool time, we did lunch somewhere, and then we went in the parks for like Cinderella's Royal Table for like a six or seven o'clock dinner. But we said, all right, you know what? We're, let's, you know, everybody's kind of tired from the pool. Let's go in at like three, three thirty, and kind of whatever. By the time you're out of that park, it felt like a full day at the park because all of your re- relax, uh, relaxing that you did earlier in the day is completely out of your head, and you're still going back to your room, right, shoving right, all the right. kids in bed, right? Like it's you're getting back at 8.30, you need to get to sleep, and all of a sudden you're waking up early because you're not doing two half days in a row. You're going, you're going to full rope drop day the next day. So my new rule is if you're doing a half a day, you either go in – mid-morning and leave mid-afternoon so your evening you have an evening dinner somewhere um you know whatever wherever so that to me that's that's a rule that you need that kind of break in the the evening if you're an evening person right if that's more important to you do you does that does that uh mesh with um you're thinking that makes total total sense that even like even in that morning if you're not if you're planning on going in later, my, the way my brain would work is I'd still be thinking about all the things we're doing and when do we have to leave. Like, I wouldn't be super restful. I mean, I guess you'd yep. sleep in a little bit, which would be nice, but it's it wouldn't really be a, a rest or it wouldn't be a half day yeah. rest like it would be uh, for the evening. And I think that's why another reason maybe we don't really do half days. We do full days off, you know, like you, we probably do two days in a, of going hardcore in a row and then we do a full day off that's why we only get say five days of park tickets for mm-hmm. our, our week-long vacation then we can rest up you know sleep in do some pool time maybe do disney springs or a, you know a, a dinner at a resort or something like that but it's it we're not worried about like well we got it we want to get to a park we want to do this we got you know fast pass light lanes whatever like for part of the day it's just it's not a park day so but the it's a, a rest for my brain i think as much as for my body well, I mean, there's a um, there's a gentleman in Discord by Skeeter. Uh, he got a shout out from Matt on the DCI show last week or last, <laughs> two weeks ago. Um, he's more of a local type where he he doesn't care. He just goes and does things. And um, there's a cer- certain segment of the population out there, the Disney fan population, that just go to the parks at ten mid morning, whatever. They kind of stroll up, kind of do their thing. Maybe they take a break in the middle. They go for two hours. They leave. They come back in the evening. In whatever, I don't understand these people. Uh, I don't know how their brain operates, but they probably have a less stressful vacation than <laughs> I do, right? They're right. they're rested and they're not going crazy and everything else like that. But that, that that's a different style. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I have my we have our opinions, and people have the a way they, they kind of do things. Um, so do you, do you incorporate? So when you're choosing your park days. Obviously, right now, the, the, there's a totally new game with um, early morning entry at this mm-hmm. point. Are you taking advantage of that every single time if you're staying on property? Yeah, I, I, or at least 95% of the time right. we were, we're going to. We're going to get there and try to take advantage of it. It's we get up in the morning, you get out the door. You're Especially now, if you're going to be booking uh, Genie Plus or anything like that, you got to do that at 7, so you're up for that anyway. Um, so yeah, we are, we are rope drop people. We, we don't always get there as early as I'd like. We're not always at the front of never rope happens. No. Um, but we, we did we it usually, once, you know, especially now, um, you know, for at least for a little bit, it's going to be 60 minutes or before when there was just, uh, extra magic hours that were, you know, a full 60 minutes for a given park, we would take advantage of that. We would get there at least during that, that time and get on a couple of things beforehand. It just helps set up the day. Um, especially when there was fast pass plus we kind of knew what rides we had fast passes for. Okay. Well, during that early hours, we're going to hit up something we didn't get a fast pass for. And why don't you read, um, you got a question from Spencer Wright on Facebook, friend of the show. Um, and he kind of goes right up on, on this question here. Yeah. So, uh, we post this uh, a number of places and uh, specifically about rope dropping. Spencer Wright asked, he goes, for me, rope dropping is really crucial, especially now. If you stay on property, attractions will begin operating prior to the opening time of the park. And he said he gives an example of that when he was there in August. He was off. Uh, he did both Pandora attractions and was done by eight ten, with a you know regular park opening of eight. 
Um, so, so I this guess is, this kind of gets to our question of, do you get up there early? Because for some people, that's very counter when you're on quote unquote vacation. Vacation mm-hmm. is supposed to be sort of like a rest from your everyday life where you're getting up early for work or whatever. <laughs> and this might be where for, for some people, uh, uh, Walt Disney World is a vacation. And for other people, it's it's not a vacation. It's a trip to Walt Disney World. So yep. I think for us, it's, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but I think for, for us, it's we want to get the value out of our money if we're going there. 100%. And a big, big part of that is that what we're spending will be in the parks and do the parks. We're going to be there for, for early entry and for rope drop. So I had our vacation, you know, I had an epiphany with my wife. My wife was able to get up and get going. And I don't know how many times I've said this, but this is our first trip where she wasn't either pregnant or taking care of an infant. <laughs> right, right, right. So she was able to get up early and kind of rock the rope drop. So we, we rope dropped the heck out of each park um, last time we went. Um, the, the interesting thing is this week they announced that there's going to be an extra 30 minutes on uh, early park entry just for the holidays. Yes. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, I think, I guess maybe next week with the new Genie Plus announcement. So we're not going to talk about this week. We're going to let them saturate in the public and see what happens with yeah, them. Yeah, it's only started, I think, either today or yesterday. So yep. it's just kind of getting going. So we haven't really felt the full impact of it. So, But the rope drop stuff is super important for your, your, your park. So like typically when we do our planning and we're picking out at park days, we have them all set. So but now you're eyeballing – um, a lot of the data that's out there is like when the rides, uh, the capa- when they hit capacity, when the lightning lanes kind of get sold out type of, not sold out, but uh, taken up type of thing. Yep. And you start really fine tuning your planning trip. So like if I know I can do like, um, you know, Epcot and hit up Remy and Frozen and Soren or like Spencer do the Pandora rides and run over to Everest and you're done with that park by like nine o'clock. If you've got hoppers, that might be an incentive to how to plan your trips with hoppers. So now you can go, you can kick butt at, at a park, get your attractions done, spend a couple more hours in the park, go back to your hotel, rest, take a, a nap, go swimming. I don't know how people take naps, by the way. Uh, <laughs> go swimming, have lunch somewhere, and then wait for your hopper uh, hopper time, and then go in the afternoon and kind of do a second park. So that's – that. I mean, that leads me to my next question because that's, that's a valid strategy a lot of people use – but um, are hoppers worth it to you at this point? So for us, we generally don't get hoppers. We find we have a full day's worth of stuff to do in each of the parks. Again, we're only going you know, for four or five days. So it also per day, the hopper kind of upcharges a little bit more than if you have a longer, it's obscene. longer trip too. Um, we have done hopping in the past. You know, we've we've gotten in the past, we've gotten the, the military salute tickets, which it just came with hopping. So we had it, we would use it. Um, but we don't use it enough to justify paying for it. Um, what you just described, though, by kind of getting up early, banging out a bunch of rides and then taking a break, we, we will still do that, especially when we have like our August trips because it's middle of the day. It's so hot. Um, we just then go back to the, the park we started at. We don't mm-hmm. hop to another park. We take that break, then go back and hit up, you know, anything we missed, anything we want to do again maybe have a meal, get ready for, you know, if it's a park with fireworks or whatever, get ready for that. So, you know, even if it's not hopping to another park, we kind of follow that strategy laid out. I've never bought hoppers because it financially don't make sense with a family of five. I mean, if you're looking at a book of eight tickets, I mean, you're looking at a 20% upcharge. Yeah. I mean, uh, for example, when I did party five, uh, three kids, two adults going from, uh, I think it was like twelve hundred dollars for or for two two tickets for each person to go to a hopper. Um, it was another like five hundred dollars, I want to say something like that. I'm like, it's just not worth my time. Now I am beginning to like think like maybe hoppers or an annual pass down the line when we want to spend that type of money. Yeah, um, makes sense when the kids are older. Yeah, um, the kids still have a great time at one park or whatever. Um, you know. My youngest is going to have to turn four in a couple of weeks, so I don't. I mean, we're, we don't have the we don't we still have a stroller, but we don't have the diaper bag and all this other stuff, so we're not lugging as much stuff. But I do not want to do buses when I've got young kids I have to worry about. So that's that's kind of the thing that I kind of chuck up to that. So the, the next question is: So we're, we we've talked about we don't do half days, um, but we do. Uh, you talk about rest days. A lot of people talk about rest days. Um, do you think what the days at in Orlando are valuable. Do you do full, re- full, full rest days? Um, just basically maybe Disney Springs Day or Resort Day type of thing. Yeah, so we do full 
by rest day, I would say I, we don't have a park ticket at all. We definitely do one or, you know, if, we, if we're we there for a week, especially if we're staying off property, we'll probably have two of those in between having four or five park days. Um, it's a lot of just kind of resting, sleeping mm-hmm. in, pool time, probably do Disney Springs one of those times. But we might do, you know, in the past we would do like something like hoop, hoop-de-doo or something like that, which kind of takes up a chunk of the afternoon or something like that but it isn't in a park. You don't have to use a park ticket to get to it. So I guess they're not rest days in that we're not, we still have things planned, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's not, we we don't go, we, we do have full days that we're not in a park that we don't use a park ticket. I'm still trying to figure out how do I do my, my trips with a longer trip with a day that I don't want to rope drop and stay to the end, right? This is kind of like a, whatever you want to do kind of day type of thing. And um, you know, my kids don't take naps. I know a lot of kids, People like to take naps. So I want to talk about the logistics of taking a break midday, right? Mm -hmm. So you're on Disney property somewhere. We're assuming that. Um, Getting from your room to the bus stop is a five to 10 minute walk. Getting from the bus to the park could be anywhere from 15 minutes if you hit the the bus perfectly to a half hour to 40 minutes if you miss a bus or the bus is full or whatever the reasoning might be. And then getting into the park to where you want to go to your first attraction is probably another half hour. Getting through the turnstiles, walking up Main Street, for example, or working all the way from, let's say, you got to the front of Epcot and you got a Remy. That's that's a long walk you got to take type of thing. So keep in mind your walk and travel time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's extremely important. So when you say if you're new to taking kids, you're new to taking grandchildren, um, you know, you're you're going with – um, you know, you are in your 20s, but you have a brother and sister that have kids and you're going with them the first time type <laughs> yeah. of thing. There's a lot of different combinations. If you don't have kids where you might have to come into this is just realize that you probably want to go full bore and full park day going to convince the people that um, they're just, oh, we'll just go back and, and go swim in the pool. If you were, let's say, at the Barnstormer in the Magic Kingdom to get back to, let's on a, let's, let's say, Monorail um, Resort, let's just say like CBR or Riverside or something, it's going to take you about an hour to untangle yourself from the parks, get on the bus, get back to it. That's a full hour gone. Mm-hmm. A yep. full hour to get back. So to leave and leave and go back, that's two hours. That's just travel time. Then you have the time to get back to the room, get settled in, get changed for the the, uh, the swimming pool or put the kid down for a nap. That could take anywhere from another half hour e- each way, maybe to an hour taking a shower and all that other type of stuff. So you're already at three-hour loss before you did any activity back at the resort, right? So if that's okay with you to waste, not waste, or use up three hours of dead time where you're not having fun, you're not enter- being entertained, you're on a bus, you're walking out, that's something you need to consider. It's not like I'll hop on a bus, get back, and we'll take yeah. a quick nap. That, it, ain't, it ain't happening. Even if you drive, I think the quickest you could probably do is get an Uber or um, or a minivan whenever they come back and pick you up at the front and then drive you back. That'll be the quickest way to get back to the parks if that's something that's very important to you. So I would suggest this is what we did. Um, all of our full park days when we had small kids were not real full park days. We always went to like the contemporary to Chef Mickey's for like two to three hours and did like a, a meal. Maybe just walked. We stayed in the air conditioning for a while. So that was kind of like a midday break. So we were never at in, in, mm-hmm. in the sun at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So consider things like that. Maybe do some monorail hopping or the resorts. You take a break that way. Um, there's a lot of different kind of things that you can kind of take a look at. But just remember when you do like a midday break, the logistics of getting to and from the parks are going to suck up a lot of your time. So be ready for that. Just be aware. And if you're okay with that, that's cool. But just be aware it's going to be three hours of nonsense. And I think that's where – paying attention to park hours when you're planning mm-hmm. things out makes sense. Cause you know, that's one thing in the, people say, how do you go to Disney in August? It's like, well, that's usually when they also have the longest park hours. Mm-hmm. So if I'm, you know, if Epcot's nine to 11 or nine to midnight, it's a lot easier to take three or four hours out in the middle Absolutely. of the day and rest versus something like animal kingdom, which might only be nine to seven, you know, then we're probably not taking a midday break. We'll do something like a sit down lunch or, you know, we'll, we'll go over to animal kingdom lodge to eat at Sanaa or something like that versus like a full break. So I think that's one thing you have to keep in mind is what are the park hours when you're going um, and, and how mu- how long do you want to take that break? How much, how many of those, what percentage of the day are you kind of missing from the parks to take your break? Yeah, I, I think you just need to 
keep in mind, even like Magic Kingdom, you're like, oh, the park basically closes at eight o'clock whenever they do the fireworks show. Sometimes there's some time afterwards and stuff like that where you can do, or you can ignore it altogether and just kind of, you know, bang out a bunch of rides as everybody's staring at the castle. But even coming back into the park at, let's say, four thirty, five o'clock, you only have a three hour sprint until the fireworks show. And that's mm-hmm. maybe two or three attractions um, if you get unlucky with some of the weights, right? If you're trying to do some mm-hmm. of the marquee stuff. So keep that in mind. Um, three hours might seem like a lot when you're in the park. And uh, all the veterans out there, probably everybody listening to this as a veteran knows exactly how <laughs> three hours is in Magic Kingdom. But just in case that, you know, um, you're going with somebody for their first or second time, you could tell them three hours is not a lot. Make sure they understand the time in the parks. The logistics is incredibly important. Um, do we have anything else we want to talk about? Plan- Did I miss anything, Phil, about planning, arranging park days? No, I think we really hit on everything. I think that's a – any other comments do you have on, like, how you put the park days together? I mean, I think we hit on some good good tips about taking those breaks and planning, you know, how dining plays a role and stuff like that. And I think it's mm-hmm. just – you know, I think this is also one of those things where for somebody who was a big planner, Fast Plus, plus – helped out our schedule right oh, like even even when we plan to take breaks we would often like say for our epcot day plan a fast pass for spaceship earth before we were going to take our break because that's at the front of the park right so you kind of planned your day a little bit about, around that it's a little harder now um it's a little crazy and, and so i think for us for us planners it's uh <laughs> it's kind of a a wild west a little bit or a brave new world that we yeah. need to kind of figure all this out and it's it you know i think that element that's why people get stressed about these changes because it's like look i had you know, all these, this is how we did things and it made the most sense. And we got those breaks in because we knew we could plan around it. And now it's like, I don't know if I can, you know, that sort of thing. So just keep in mind as, as, as Disney continues to evolve, Jason hinted at it, that they've already made an adjustment over the holidays to, to Genie plus and, and early entry and stuff. So things are going to keep changing. So even if, if you're, no, you're going for spring break next year, it could look a lot different now, which, which for those of us, like we said, we have our spreadsheets nine months in advance. You have to yeah. be prepared to uh, do it in Excel, not in a permanent marker. On Sunday. that's it. That's it. And my my ADR time is as as of recording this in about nine hours from now. Yeah. So by the time this comes out, I would have either I'm either going to be incredibly disappointed and sad, <laughs> or frustrated, or hitting up the uh, touring plans um, dining finder that we yeah. talked about last week. I'm going to be making heavy use of that. We were originally going to use our travel agent to do it, but as we're trying to coordinate these things, we're like, no, no, my sister and I are just going to wake up early and just yeah. just do it ourselves. Because I found that in the past. I mean, we've used travel agents in the past, and they really, I found they really help with the hotel rooms and stuff like that. But when it yeah. came to like ADRs or fast pass, and the, I just some of them I think are great, and maybe they would have done a wonderful job, but I just didn't want to chance it. I'm like, yeah. I, I, I kind of know what I'm it like, is. I'll get up, I'll do it, and like, well, we're gonna have her do it, and we sent her a list of the things that we wanted to do. And she's like, well, this one might be incredibly hard to do. I'm like, I know. So no. you need to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, you know what? I don't want to blame. I don't want to be like, oh, we didn't get it. And then have to blame her. And, and it's That's probably part not going to be her fault. Where, right? Where like, she could have done everything in her power to do it. And it's not her fault that there's like, it's really hard to get stuff now. <laughs> well, I don't want to be like thinking like, could I have done it better? Could I have exactly. done it faster? Yeah. And, and, and honestly, it's going to be better because we have to make two reservations for everything. My party and my sister's party. So if we're doing it simultaneously, there's a better chance that we'll have yeah. matching times and stuff. For like sure. That. So that, that's going to make sense. Um, okay. So we're going to move to this week's attractionality. And it's um, it's an easy one. Put this up on the screen for those that are watching out there. Uh, this week was um, Prince Charming's Carousel. And I'm trying to get to the description here. Climb aboard one of the 90 wood-carved ornate horses or one of the intricately carved chariots at this classic attraction inspired by Disney's Cinderella, bedecked in golden helmets, decorative shields, and flowing flower garlands and feathers. Each beautiful horse is unique. So this is an interesting one because it's just kind of like it's a carousel. And it's got some history. It's got some definite history to it. Yeah. Which is really cool. So I suggest everybody go out there and – Find one of the many YouTubes that kind of go over the history of, of this. Yeah, this the one tour we did of uh, Magic Kingdom, we stopped at the the carousel and they pointed out a lot of the the things on it and things that kind of look kind of funny to be on a carousel in Disney World and stuff like that. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I I definitely if you if you're interested in that sort of thing, it's it's worth researching a little bit. There's plenty on YouTube. There's plenty of books. I mean, if you're kind of that type of person, bring it with you into the park and kind of <laughs> investigate it. It's some some cool stuff. So in that case. Let's just start off with this question number one, Phil. I, and I think, um, as you're seeing on the screen, there's not many um, disagreements with this one. This one's kind of um, 
everybody kind of agreed almost almost anything. This the first question is the one that was kind of evenly distributed by all the answers is how much do you like the concept of this attraction? Phil, what do you think? I gave it a five. I mean, the concept of a carousel. I mean, it obviously has all the history with, you know, even with Walt when he saw his girls riding a carousel and that, you know, kind of prompted everything. So I think the idea of a carousel in a Disney park, the light Cinderella theming, I think, is really light. (laughs) But, um, you know, it might make more sense if it was Mary Poppins or something like that. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's such a classic thing. It fits well. Um, The concept of, of a carousel in Disney makes sense. I mean, I gave this a five. I'm sorry, you gave it a five, right? I did, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I gave it a five as well for all the same reasons. Uh, even going back to our conversation weeks ago where this, the, the parks need more light, easy to get yeah. on attractions to kind of eat people and not have to wait an hour for. Um, I think this is perfect. And I think I there was a couple places on Twitter. I don't know if it was Blog Mickey or some of the other journalists and bloggers that are out there, but they were like, do Ferris wheels belong in Disney parks? Because they have one in DCA on the West Coast. I think they absolutely do, as long as it's well made and well themed and put together, and it works, and it doesn't look like some kind of, you know, traveling carnival ride that creaks and kind of sways yeah. around type of thing. I think they absolutely do. So, how well do you think Prince Charming Car- Roy- Regal Carousel delivers for its target audience? So, when I put my comments about this this ride, I think I'm a little bit biased based on how much my kids enjoy it, specifically my youngest. Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of I have her face in my mind when I'm thinking what the target audience is, <laughs> and she absolutely loves it. Yep. Um, it's it's one of the rides we probably do multiple times. You know, the mo- one of the rides we do the most often during a trip. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, that's in my mind what the target audience is. So I think it totally delivers for that. So I give it a five. Get, yeah, yeah, five. Give it yes, five. there we go. Yeah. I give it a four. Um, I mean, you could talk me into a five, but I give it a four because A, it is just a simple ride, right? It goes around and it's enjoyable by a lot of children. My children love it to death. Um, and it's nice to kind of just sit down for a couple of minutes and just kind of do some people watching and watch the joy in your kid's face and stuff like that. Um, I only gave it a four just because of its simplicity's sake, right? Yeah. So, um, how much do you personally enjoy the carousel? I gave this a three because it's a carousel. I'm trying to keep my kid from falling off the horse and that's basically <laughs> my main job. So I don't truly enjoy it as much as I guess I could. What about I, you? Pretty, I gave it a three for pretty much the, the same reason. I think it's more for, <laughs> for my kids than it is for yes. myself. I mean, I personally enjoy watching my kids enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the ride itself, like I wouldn't, if I was on like a parents only trip, I don't think we would ride it, you know? So yeah. it was hard for me to give it, you know, higher than a three. We didn't actually go on this. Now that I'm thinking about it, we didn't go about this on our on our quick trip. There's like one of the mm-hmm. couple of rides that we didn't go on just because it just didn't make sense as we were walking through. Mm-hmm. Um, and what about the fit? How well do you think the carousel fits into Fantasyland and the Magic Kingdom? I give this yeah. a four because it's it's a fantasy thing. It fits. I think it, I give it a five, especially the location of it right behind the castle. Perfect, I think it's yeah. it's pretty magical kind of you know, riding around, especially when you see the, the little kids in princess outfits and stuff like that. So fit like from that standpoint, like the the very specific physical fit, I gave it a five. I'm trying to be a little bit varied with my yeah. fives, right? I want to, for some for some reason, if we keep doing this for like another year, I want to be like, <laughs> wow, Jason gave this one a five. It must be great instead of like what everybody else does in Discord. Yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. Everything's a five. It's perfect. <laughs> I'm like, God, I'm tone it down a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think this was an easy one. Um, I don't think anybody argues with the carousel and its theming and its operations. Everybody loves it. You either do it or you don't. People don't complain about the use of this space, right? It just kind of fits. And like, the one it, thing that I think is good about it is, I, I mean, at like Disneyland California Adventure, there's another carousel, but there's not. It's not like a Dumbo ride where there's a bunch of spinners throughout mm-hmm. Walt Disney World. There's, this this is really the only true carousel, so I think it's it's unique. Whereas, you know, some people maybe don't like Carpets of Aladdin or something like that. It's like, well, there's a better version of this. There, there isn't like a better version of the carousel at Walt no. Disney World. So. No, no, and, and I don't think you could use that space for anything else. It'd just be right. more concrete at this. Point. Yeah, yeah. So um, we successfully have kept our first topic from from going over um the the 30 minute mark me phil and i were like we are making sure we get to the second half of the show which we didn't do (laughs) last week um and this segment is basically what everybody else is talking about yeah and people are still talking about this even though we didn't talk about it last week people are (laughs) still talking about this i know the diz unplugged put on a show i saw i didn't watch it but i saw the youtube thumbnail of um uh what is going on with the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser? Um, I've got a couple notes here. I'm going to switch back. I'm going to load these up here. So, Phil, take it away. What? Are, what? What's the like the general hubbub? Why is this? Yeah. Thing? So this came up. Um, 
you know, it's been coming up for a little while, but it really in the last week or so came up because of some of the advertising or marketing that Disney has been using related to the Galactic Star Cruiser. I think some of it started when at the Destination D23, when in one of the panels they showed some of the footage of of Josh DeMauro getting to go to the Galactic Star Cruiser and doing the lightsaber training and stuff like that. And it just looked it looked a little underwhelming from a weird technical standpoint and how it is. It just didn't live up to the concept art. And then they had a, a video that um, Disney actually wound up removing after there was so much negative feedback where they went. And it's they amazing. Showed, um, they showed, um, I believe her, her name is Gaia, who's going to be kind of the lounge singer. And it oh, just man. so many people just had negative comment. And it just the biggest thing that seems to come out is a it just doesn't look impressive or like look like, OK, I'm, pay, I'm paying five thousand dollars for this. It needs to look more impressive. But also, it just doesn't feel like Star Wars. It feels no. like a generic space adventure or something like that, where you think of Star Wars, it's much more gritty. And I know this is supposed to feel more like Canto Bite. And the, but it doesn't even look like thing. that. Yeah, it's just, it. I don't know. Every time, though, I, I hear them talk about the, the storyline aspects of it. And there was a, a video put out where somebody had gotten some insider information and the way they describe it. Like, if that comes to fruition, the whole story element, I think, will be really impressive, really immersive. But when they show, like, the bridge, I'm like, okay, this looks like the 90s, the 1970s Star Trek, you know, like as far as like the buttons you're pushing and stuff, it doesn't yeah. look really high quality and futuristic. And it just, it kind of looks like a, a Disney quest thing and not something <laughs> I'm paying $5,000 for my family to spend two nights there. So that's kind of like, and then they just keep coming out. They, they sent guests uh, a little email that had a video again, welcoming them to that. And it again, there's another alien, a, a female alien that had, different colored skin it's like okay that's that's all you're using apparently mm -hmm. and now there's reports that a lot of trip people are potentially canceling trips there's there's where calendars were completely blocked now well, let, let's opening, let's so, uh, let's stop right there before we get into okay. the cancellation part of things i've got up on the screen because you can't see it is the captain keevan keevan Ke keevan yeah. uh character um and to me when i look at this is like her uniform is like super clean but like she looks like like a children's car, uh, show where she has mm -hmm. to put the makeup on every single day, and she doesn't look like a Star Wars character. It it, yeah. it just it just looks. Weird. And I know the the races of 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 the characters they're picking are from Star Wars. They're in some of the uh, cartoons. They're in some of the books, but they're not picking like Wookies or you know like they're not picking these characters that are absolutely Star Wars. Like that is well, I mean, caught, I don't, you know. I don't care about the race, though, right? I mean, like, yeah. I get wanting to see Wookiees and aliens and stuff like yeah. that, but blue-skinned woman, she just looks phony, right? Yeah. So there's a major, major YouTube channel out there, Star Wars Theory, and this guy does a lot of great content. Yeah. I mean, he's got, I don't know, 2.8 million followers. At least. I, mean, I think he's over 3 million now. It's 3 like, million it's, now. It's he's got, video. yeah, each one of his videos, whether it's a simple little podcast to something that he produces, which has excellent production quality, they get tens and hundreds of thousands of views. So this guy has a long reach within the Star Wars community. He did like a... Um, an episode where he just kind of watched the promotional material and you just got to see his reaction to it. Yeah. And he was saying like, I mean, this guy's a huge influencer in the star Wars world. And it just mirrored what a lot of other people were saying. It doesn't look like star Wars. It looks fake. It looks like a cheap knockoff essentially. Yeah. And I've got the picture still up on the screen and you know, I, I don't want to, criti I hate critiquing, critique, critiquing. I can't even say words tonight. Critiquing, Man, critiquing somebody's work like this. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't look like a Star Wars. I mean, like I, I said this before, like the uniform doesn't look right. It looks like somebody's uh, really good Halloween costume. Yeah. That's what it looks like to me. And we don't have to look at that anymore. So not only that, the sets, people were complaining about the sets. They look too clean. Not that like not that everything in Star Wars has to be dirty, but it, it just didn't look like a Star Wars ship. It looked like a hallway with some plastic on the walls, so to speak. Yeah. What was your impression of like the sets, I guess, whatever you want to yeah, call it? Yeah, it looked very – there just wasn't enough on the walls, like you said, to – like, and maybe they're not done. Maybe they'll add stuff, make it more they're interesting with, with, with pictures and stuff like that. But, yeah, it looked very plain. And then, you know, like you went – the scenes where you went on the bridge, it looked like, okay, there's all these things, but only a couple buttons were really doing anything. And it, it just didn't live up to expectations. And 
don't know if this is jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm kind of one of those people that was on the fence about, do I want to do this or not? It's a lot of money. And I think I would like it, but maybe not. Like for me, I was going to have to be blown away to commit this money. And it's making oh, yeah. me go the other way. You know, it's making me like happy. I haven't put the money down because I don't think it's going to live up to what it needs to. No, I mean, like it's going to be visually impressive with the screens and stuff like that, because it's going to be the same technology as like the yeah. Millennium Falcon and stuff like that. That stuff's going to look awesome. Problem is like, you know, the, the picture that just had up of the bridge, like the, the, the TV screens are like square. Yes, they look like that in the original Star Wars because that's all they had back then. But things have changed. Control panels have changed with, you know, newer technologies and newer newer movies and stuff like that. You don't need to have something that looks like straight out of a classroom from 1986 when you're working on the, you know, the Apple exactly. 2E plus <laughs> type of thing with some floppy disks. And the, the bridge didn't even look like a bridge. It just looked like a bunch of, like, consoles later on. It was just, just like a room with, like, yeah, it was like, it's funny that you say that. It's like like going to uh, the computer lab in your yeah. grammar school. <laughs> Because it didn't, it didn't look like there's a place for like a captain's chair with like a yeah. visual and then like you know. You and maybe get... it will be better in real, but this is what they're using as marketing, right? This yes. is what they're trying to convince people to spend five thousand dollars for two nights, and it's it's doing the opposite. Well, I mean, even even the bar scene where they had a woman singing, like you you brought this yeah. up, and they took it down, which is like crazy that they spent all this money to produce something like this. They had somebody come in and sing and perform, and. It it didn't look like a bar scene. Like I mean, I if you if you want to if you want to have a bar with a singer, typically that's going to be like a background type of thing. It's just like a, mm -hmm. like a lounge singer type of thing. I think that's what people are looking for on these things. Yeah, exactly. And like a big bustling bar with some. I mean, obviously you can't do it because of COVID and everything else like that type of thing. But like. This is such a crazy performance. Like, no, no one's looking for that. They want to walk in and just be like a normal bar. You walk in, maybe somebody's playing on stage somewhere or whatever. It's not this, you know, production type of thing. And then everybody's wearing like their their best, like ball gowns and stuff like that. And we're not used to seeing that type of thing in Star yeah. Wars. So th I think that was a mistake. And then, you know, again, not to critique somebody's performance, but the gentleman and the woman um, – that were kind of doing like the intro on that whole yeah. video. Yeah. That was so cringeworthy. Who thought that was a good idea to kind of release to the public? Well, or did they fire <laughs> all the smart people in marketing at Disney? Is, is yeah. that basically what happened? I don't know. I don't know. So you brought up cancellation. So let's go to the cancellation yeah. aspect. I'm going to bring this up on the screen here. So as I mentioned, uh, we're seeing more and more availability being showing up among the calendar where it used to be, uh, blocked out you know the, they said the first three months are totally booked well all of a sudden things are appearing more and more now we don't know exactly how many rooms are free it could only be one on each of those days or whatever yeah um, but we know for at least one month they even took the calendar down for a bit i believe it's back up now but i don't know it's just i think a lot of people got excited when it first came out and said okay i'll put down my deposit and then now there's now See what we're coming up to the because it has a 90 day notice of cancellation. That's a big thing with this. It's not, you know, 30 days or whatever, like for a regular resort. Um, so you need to be decide. You know, the people that are going in March had to decide by now. Are, are we doing mm -hmm. this or not? And I think a lot of people are like, I, I just can't justify the money for what what they're showing. No, you so far. no. Um, I, if, if, if I was doing the marketing for this, you, I would do like a total dry run like you bring in. I don't know, some friends of, and family of like executives, people that you could trust, right? They're not going to mm -hmm. be spilling the beans about it and do one full re run through and just have like hidden cameras or whatever, following people around and then edit from, you know, 48 hours worth of, you know, footage, right? Kind yeah. of kind of something like that. So no one's, I, I mean, I, don't, I, I never trust marketing material from any company, right? Where it's like all glitzy and perfect, whatever. But people want to see good, cool clips of what's going on behind the scenes there, you know, and unless it, it's really terrible and they didn't want to do that. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. So I'm very interested to see how this, this I hope I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not going to yeah. be able to afford this yeah, anytime I, soon. I do but. want to stress that too, that it, it, there's a lot of kind of negativity around this and I don't think people are bashing it just to bash it. I think it's, it's something we people want, want to work. They want it to be amazing they want to be able to do it. They want it to be so amazing that they find the money to do it. Um, and I think it's just, again, we kind of talked about this, I guess. It's, it's not that we think it's horrible. It's just we feel like they could do better. Especially and, with that price point. Like, exactly. What I saw would be like 
give me your most expensive room at the Polynesian for like two nights type of cost, mm-hmm. like you know a thousand dollars a night type of thing. And if I'm spending two grand for this experience, let's say for two people, whatever it is, yeah, then that's kind of more justifiable from what I'm expecting. But if I'm spending five to six thousand dollars for something like this, then that is not a product that I want. And I love this concept. I probably wouldn't do Star Wars for my family just because there's not enough st- major Star Wars fans type of thing. Mm-hmm. But like staying at a Disney castle, or a princess castle type of thing, like a Frozen adventure or you know, pick any other Disney, a Moana adventure where you're on an island or something kind of neat. Toy type Story of thing. where you're a toy for the whole, you know, two nights. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, exactly. Lots of, lots of other areas this could be used in. Sure. And I want to see them do more of this stuff. I want to see like four or five of these things all on property. I mean, if Disney wants to really suck money out of people, like this is the way to go. I mean, it's not going to be for me at this price point, but might maybe those people get out of the parks for one of these days and make it less crowded. I don't know. Um, so we'll see. I hope it succeeds. I hope, you know, the good thing about this is they can always probably tweak the makeup and tweak the actors and kind of do and all this And I do think, you stuff. know, some of it might have just that been like the thing. forcing – you know, commercial lighting into spaces that aren't meant to have it and stuff like That's that. True. So, so the the actual experience I still think will be a, a lot point. better and a lot different. It's just if if they're really sold out for like the first three months or were like, why were they? Why do they feel the need to release these? I guess it's almost my like question when it's not. I don't think a full true depiction of what it's going to be like. But well, I mean, I if they we'll booked the out. first three months out. Maybe the the bookings after that were so dreadful that like they had to yeah. start incentivizing it a little bit. I'm not too sure, but we'll we'll f- we'll find out yep. in a couple Pretty months. Couple months, yep. Um, and we'll go from there. And, and guess what? We're at the 55 minute mark, Phil. Perfect. Just enough time for your DBC recommends because I saw that you filled something in there. I did, but I, I think I'm going to throw you for a loop and, and change it up just because I think it okay. applies to our the topic we're going to talk about next week. Um. So I'm just going to recommend uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. Uh, I got to see it yesterday with my son. My wife took my daughter to see it today because my youngest didn't want to see it. I recommend it, and I recommend, if you're comfortable doing it, uh, seeing it in the theater experience. It's kind of one of those where there were moments where everyone was cheering and stuff like that, and it's been a long time since we've had one of those movies. Um, I know with the way numbers are going, maybe not everyone's comfortable going to a theater, but if you are, maybe there's one that enforcing masks or something like that. Um, I, I would recommend doing it for this movie. I was thinking about it. Um, numbers are not very good where I am right now. Um, and I don't know about mask wearing in this area. Yeah. It's 50 Where I am, it's mandated. So it's, that made me a little more comfortable. It's a little bit too. more comfortable. Um, I was thinking maybe after the second or third week, you find some like 9 a.m. show yeah. on a Saturday morning <laughs> or something and, and get to go. Because yesterday... Funnily enough, I had my kids watch the first two Spider-Man movies with mm-hmm. um, uh, Tobey Maguire um, mm-hmm. and everything. So we're going to be watching three at sometimes over the Christmas break nice. and then catch up on the other Spider-Man movies because my kids love Spider-Man. Um, but I'm just like, I don't know if I want to take them to the movies. We haven't been to the movies since Moana, I think, is the last time we yeah. I brought the kids to a movie. So I heard it did excellent this week at like 500 something million dollars, 580, 538 something. something yeah, like, like that. I think worldwide, yeah. So domestic, it was, they were thinking it might do 150, and then it did like 130 the first day or something like yeah. that. So it's like, it's really, it's they definitely the it. first big one uh, yeah, since the pandemic started. It's by far the biggest weekend. And apparently people think Marvel was dead, but I guess not, right? <laughs> I, I think they're doing it. lives that. on. Um, I, I think what we'll have to do is I'm not caught up on Hawkeye. I know you've, you've, you've finished it. I, I think sometime well, over the This week's the, the last. Break. Yeah, this, uh, this Wednesday is the last episode. Right. So I ha- I'm, I'm only three episodes in. So I've okay. got a couple. To ca- i got two to catch up on. Um, and then I think once it's done, we'll do our Hawkeye nice. breakdown show. And I think we'll do like a little bonus episode, whatever, whatever we want to call, call that. Okay, so we're under an hour, even with the, with the DBC recommends, guys. We uh, we appreciate you listening. Make sure you like and subscribe. Leave a comment, even if it is to say hi or you don't like us. Either way, but <laughs> comments are welcome. And um, subscribe and all that other stuff. And Phil, where can they find us? And then we'll say goodbye. So you can find us on social media at Twitter at PodDBC, Instagram, the DBC Podcast, Facebook, DBC Pod, YouTube channel, Discord server. And one thing that I haven't mentioned in a while is we do have an email address the DBC podcast at gmail.com. So if you want to send us emails Wonderful. with questions or thoughts, that's where you can send it. 
I just realized that like, as I stare at you, like I have your screen on this monitor over here. I, I have like three of your faces across my whole <laughs> spectrum here. But I look at this monitor where we're recording off of, but I realize I should be looking like this. And often I'll, I'll kind of go like this to look at you and people might be saying, what is, what am I doing? I'm looking at another <laughs> screen, which I thought. should be. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm never deep in thought. <laughs> um, all right, guys, have a great week. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll catch you next time. See you Take later, care. everybody. Happy holidays.